A very good afternoon to you all. Thank you for watching UBC Television. My name is Wadulo Mark Anol and this is the weekly news roundup edition of the Lunchtime News. The bulletin that brings you those stories that made headlines from within the week. And without further ado, let's start off. Government this week directed that both public and private institutions mainstream HIV-related interventions in their work plans. Now, this was revealed by the Prime Minister Robina Nabanja during the annual HIV-AIDS symposium spearheaded by the Uganda AIDS Commission. Let's have some details from this report. The annual HIV-AIDS review for 2021-2022 has shown that adolescent girls and young women still bear the burden of HIV infection compared to their male counterparts. According to Uganda AIDS Commission, the national HIV prevalence rate stands at 5.2% and for the women, the prevalence is at 6.6% and the men, 3.8%. The review also shows that 54,000 new infections are registered annually and majority are women. Quickly say what 95, 95, 95 stands for. And this is the global commitment. And we have committed as a country that by 2025, 95% of the people living with HIV in Uganda will know their HIV status. And if they know their status, we will link them to care and that 95% of those who are on treatment, uh, I mean, of those who know their status will be in care. And then the third 95 is that of those who are in care, 95% will be virally suppressed. So when we look at our data, it shows us that we are doing, not doing well on the first 95, which is the uh, the people living with the, the, the HIV knowing their positive HIV status. We are at 89% at uh, for all ages. Prime Minister Robin Anabanja has directed that all institutions, both public and private, mainstream HIV related interventions in their programming. As a government policy, I therefore instruct that all state, state and non-state actors should ensure HIV is mainstreamed in all interventions. <laughs> I am happy that the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development has done the same by instructing all ministries, departments, and agencies, including local governments, to allocate at least some money out of their budgets to support HIV and AIDS activities. Financing for HIV also came high on agenda, where stakeholders want government to operationalize the HIV AIDS Trust Fund. On HIV and AIDS financing, as we've already talked about, I am aware that a discussion has already started so that the current donor support is used for sustainability instead of donor reliance. Indeed, as government, this is a discussion that is long overdue. Nonetheless, this will require a systematic approach to ensure that the investments made and gains achieved are not reversed. The U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, Natalie Brown, plagued U.S. support to HIV fight in Uganda, although stigma and discrimination remain a challenge. This includes extending ongoing efforts by agencies involved in foreign assistance to promote respect for the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons and advance non-discrimination. Fostering a hostile legal environment and creating more legal barriers would worsen the HIV epidemic in Uganda. The number of people living with the HIV still stands at 1.4 million. Adiana Kote, UBC. And relatedly, government is working on modalities for the rollout of the HIV prevention therapy. The long-acting pre-exposure prof prophylaxis, commonly referred to as the PrEP, is medicine to 
or rather this medicine is transfused into an individual to protect them from acquiring HIV. And according to the Uganda AIDS Commission, this will help to curb the number of new HIV infections. Let's have some details on the story. The 2021-2022 HIV AIDS Annual Review Symposium has come at a time when strides have been made in HIV care and treatment. One of the milestones include the approval of the long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis, commonly referred to as PrEP, that helps to prevent one from getting HIV. As opposed to the one tablet taken every day, the long-acting PrEP is transfused into an individual to offer protection for a couple of weeks. According to Uganda AIDS Commission, the Ministry of Health is working on the rollout plan. That's hugely convenient. It means that you do not, instead of taking pills on a daily basis, once you have an injection, you'll wait two months before you have the next one. And uh, the adherence issues, issues related to stigma and discrimination, issues of convenience, you know, whether you can, you will forget. You know you have uh, an opportunity to focus on other things and only wait, you know, in a period when this comes up. So definitely it has huge, huge advantages. But again, like I said, it will not be compulsory. It will be a method of choice. This initiative is commended for it will reduce new HIV infections. A long-acting Cabotegrava uh, injectable prep or Cabele as uh, it's popularly known, uh, is a very new initiative uh, where they infuse PrEP uh, into the body and uh, long acting it means uh, it, 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 it stay, the drug levels stay in the body and offer protection against acquiring HIV for long, um, usually up to three months. Uh, it's a new initiative and uh, we are delighted that our government has uh, adopted it uh, as a new tool uh, for preventing HIV and uh, what's more exciting is that uh, We've had struggles with oral prep, the tablets, swallowing a daily pill. Uh, people have not been taking them. People living with HIV have commended this milestone of long-acting ARVs. If you're now giving them that long-time option, it will really help to cap such a um, uh, that spread of HIV because they will be adhering to their medication. We are looking at ending new HIV infections. So if we are ending HIV infections and we are targeting such kind of groups, it will help. This year's three-day HIV AIDS symposium ended with stakeholders calling for a transition from donor-led HIV financing to government-led financing for HIV-related activities. This has awakened the discussion around the HIV AIDS Trust Fund. When we talk about sustainable development and we talk about the pillars of health, there is nothing that is going to happen unless we deal with HIV AIDS. When we talk about Africa Agenda 2063 and the pillars of health, we are only going to talk about Africa Agenda 2063 if indeed we are going to have funding. So Uganda has had a Uganda that Ugandan position must now be fed into the East African position. And I want to believe that there are Kenyans here, there are Ugandans here, there are Tanzanians here, and we must have meetings that are reporting meetings. But Parliament has already pronounced itself on this fact. For whatever reason, Minister of Finance is convinced that uh, this is not a, a, a fund that could be among the priority funds because there are some which have been set up. We agree. And from the commissioner's submission, we are actually more than enthusiastic to have a single treasury account. If that was what is happening, but we are aware some substantial amounts of HIV and AIDS resources don't go you are basket. So if you are to convince us and you are serious, put your foot down. Let all resources that come within the country have a one-stop center. The 2021-2022 HIV AIDS Annual Review has shown that HIV is still a public health threat with 15,000 new infections registered annually. Adiana Kuti, UBC.
Well, it is now official that Uganda Broadcasting Corporation will broadcast live the FIFA World Cup tournament in Qatar. Together with its sister radio and TV stations, UBC bought off free-to-air rights for the nation. More details in this report. A few days to the official opening of the FIFA World Cup, Uganda Broadcasting Corporation is to relay live the World Cup tournament in Qatar. Unlike before, all its sister stations will take on the games to all the masses across the country. With a projection of over 5 billion people across the world to watch the games, Ugandans have a chance to watch the games exclusively free. While addressing the press at the media center in Kampala, the Minister of Information and National Guidance, Chris Baliomonsi, highlighted how government released up to 1.56 billion shillings for the games. And I want to congratulate UBC because you have secured the rights and you will be the one to air the live matches beginning November 20th. So the free air rights, or which we abbreviate as FTA, is free and exclusive to UBC. And the games, the World Cup games, will be airing on UBC and Star TV and all the 11 radio stations of UBC across the country. The 2022 FIFA World Cup, Qatar, was moved from the traditional World Cup finals of June calendar, as we all know, to November, December, due to Qatar's intense summer heat. On its mandate as the national broadcaster, UBC will not only offer a chance for the audience to watch the games, but equally be part of the tournament through various activations. We want to assure Ugandans that we have the rights fully paid by government. The matches will be broadcast and as you know, free to air and as the national broadcaster, we are now in talks even with you, the private media, because we are going to involve, we want to rally everyone to look at this as a common good for Uganda. We are going to invite some of your sports journalists from the other media houses to join UBC team in the commentaries. It is important for every corporate, every organization, every advertiser to look out for that one single biggest human gathering together on television. If you can't have your product there, then there's a challenge. So our appeal, our message, our preaching to all the corporates, all uh, organization is one thing. Be part of the 2022 FIFA World Cup Qatar. The minister further retaliated government's commitment towards the promotion of sports through the construction of sports facilities, as well as the talent identification strategy. The government of Uganda prioritizes sports, and we shall do everything possible to promote sports in this country. Yes, the interest is there, but the discussion is still going on. So maybe when they have matured, that's when we can officially announce the outcome. Yes, but we are desirous of not only hosting the African Cup of Nations, but even many other sporting events. Meanwhile, over a week away, all eyes are on the squads being selected by the 32 countries involved. Each nation must name a minimum of 23 players and a maximum of 26 in their squad, three of which must be goalkeepers. They have until Monday, November 14, to submit squads to FIFA. FIFA will then officially publish all squad lists on Tuesday. Many nations have already begun to name their squads including Wales, England, France, Brazil, Germany and Spain among other countries. In other news, Parliament this week passed a motion to have a select committee of seven members of the House to investigate the operations of the National Council of Sports and the related funding to the whole sports sector. This was on the floor of the House by Asman Basalira, who expressed concern over the inconsistency of the funding 
Parliament allocates to National Council of Sports, plus what is given out to the various national federations. The Speaker of Parliament, Anita Aneta Monk, said that Parliament shall not add more money to the National Council of Sports before governance issues are handled at the Secretariat. The Committee of Seven selected is chaired by Kan Kanusu Lola. The other members on the committee include Kayemba Solomon, Honorable Isavide Edi, Honorable Donald Katarikwa, Honorable Achibu Agnes, Honorable Margaret Mahoa. The National Council of Sports has for some time been on the spot over the allocation of sports funds. Federations like boxing and rugby have always come with claims that football as a game is given a lion's share, leaving other sports disciplines with little or no funds. Other sports federations were suggesting that money should be allocated according to the performance at continental and international levels. All the submissions from both, there are, there are some inconsistencies between the figures of yesterday and today, of what was appropriated and what is being released be released, the appropriation of parliament was reading a different figure. Finance wrote to National Council and gave different figures. It does not seem to be right in as far as these federations are concerned. Yesterday we received information that actually in the first quarter they received nothing. All federations, they received nothing. That was the information we received yesterday. But the executive was saying that they had actually given federations something. And in the actual sense, nothing was given. The inconsistencies in these figures reveal that there is something wrong. Furthermore, the management of Uganda Broadcasting Corporation this week held a meeting with the Presidential Press Unit at the Broadcast House in Kampala. The Managing Director, Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, Winston Agaba, welcomed the Senior Press Secretary to the President, Sandor Warlusimbi, to UBC and promised him continued cooperation. The Presidential Press Unit is the official media outlet for Uganda's President. The presidential press unit is tasked to, among others, relay live addresses from the president, share video and audio recordings and news articles to both local and international media houses. This is the analog archiving room for the president. So here we keep tapes uh, containing material uh, where the president has commissioned, uh, opened roads and any other function where he has been present or where he has officiated. Karonga Steven has been part of this unit since 2005 and he expounds more about his assignment. The presidential unit is almost like a mini media house that is basically tasked with the publishing presidential news, news and the features, articles, you see. Harriet Nambi, who also has closely worked with PPU for years, is the head of TV production. The importance of this uh, material is, for example, if you want to refer to an event which made history, this is where to go, this is where to come. Yeah, so a station, I believe, is as rich or as good as its archives. As to whether, apart from UBC and State House, can members of the general public access this archive, this is a question we posed to Nambi. One has to write to the press secretary, to the president, requesting uh, for a particular video and state the purpose of why they want that video for. So after he sanctions it, he gives us instruction and we can give that material free of charge. 
The unit tours offices have over the years been housed at the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation premises along Nile Avenue in Kampala as this Wednesday received the overall overseer of its operations, Sanda Walusimbi, the senior press secretary to the president of Uganda. Um, of course, in every, in every institution you have the challenges, but of course there are always solutions to them. Um, there are solutions which we are going to look into um, and to make sure that, uh, the, that the unit um, is functioning efficiently. Before having this guided tour, Mr. Sanda Walusimbi had earlier convened for a meeting with the top management of Uganda Broadcasting Corporation led by the managing director, Winston Agaba. Um, we welcome you at UBC and we are looking forward to a partnership where we deliver on our mandate. As UBC, we look forward to giving you all the support uh, in this new role that you have uh, taken on and uh, also to thank you and your team for the cordial working relationships that we have grown over the time. The engagement is among others seeking to draw a way forward on how best can the president's message be disseminated across the entire country. We're looking at the presidency here and how best we can showcase um, the president's agenda. Um, media plays a very key role, very key role in doing that. And uh, our job is to make sure that uh, uh, the team works efficiently, effectively, within, of course, the limited resources that we have. This is expected to cut across all media outlets in Uganda. Let's, let's all be patriots. Let's all be nationalistic in our field. Let's, uh, when, when you see the president out there, um, why, take a keen interest okay, in everything that he's saying and help us amplify his message. Robert Nyango. UBC News. Now, in other news, Bank of Uganda this week said that it, it has maintained its position, reiterating that the country's debt is actually manageable and there is no cause for alarm. The 80 trillion debt, according to Bank of Uganda, stands at 50% of the gross domestic product, GDP, although the levels keep changing, basing on the foreign exchange rates. The central bank has also warned against commercial banks borrowing with the view that the move is likely to weaken the currency reserves. This follows Bank of Uganda's officials meeting with Parliament's Committee on Finance. Recently, the Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development naived releases from the consolidated fund in a move to arrest the increasing level of inflation. This, accordingly to Bank of Uganda, was a step ahead of a better health for the economy. It should be noted that the first and second quarter of financial year 2022-2023, government released less of the planned 25%, leading to a scarcity budget. So that was able to control more liquidity in the system. So it helped us at that time to ensure that the currency becomes stable. The move accompanied by other policies of government has prompted parliament to engage with officials of Bank of Uganda to understand the status of the economy. Ugandans expect service delivery, especially in the road sector, health sector, education. And because of trying to control inflation, all these sacrifices are being made for the time being, rightfully being made. While appearing before the Parliament's Finance Committee, the acting governor of Bank of Uganda, Michael Ating, and his subordinates were in place to defend the country's economic status. Is Bank of Uganda a signatory to these um, loans, the, the debts that we, uh, we, are, we are going to acquire from the river? Last week, Parliament approved a loan request by government to borrow 1.7 trillion from Standard Chartered Bank. However, Bank of Uganda warns against commercial borrowings with a view of weakening the country's currency reserves. We have a challenge in that the debt service in the next two, three years is quite big as a result of the commercial loans we took. They have a short repayment period. Uh, it would look like that we have not yet realized the necessary foreign currency to service and that's why our reserves are partly affected. Accordingly, Bank of Uganda reaffirms that the current 80 trillion shillings debt, which represents 50% of the gross domestic product GDP, is manageable and no need to cause for alarm. If, for example, you look at our tax revenues, yeah. the debt service to tax revenues ratio, 
uh, it's very worrying, it's about 30%. So it means that for every shilling you collect as taxes, 30 cents goes on debt service. Bank of Uganda rallied members of parliament to preach the gospel of value addition by promoting local productivity and boost the country's import substitution. The markets in the region, I mean, are so big that if we were to promote the manufacture of exports, we would really get some good money. And that would ameliorate the foreign exchange pressure that we are facing today. Uganda's foreign debt stands at 47 trillion and the domestic debt at 33 trillion shillings, respectively. Daniel Mugoya, Gloria Guitabinji, UBC News. The bah Bahanguzi East Constituency Member of Parliament, Asera Stephen Itaza, this week dragged two residents of Bunyoro to court over using his name and NIN number in land conflict. The two, namely Muhumuza Job and Nyabongo Charles, registered a customary land into freehold in Chikube district, leading to threats of eviction of over 1,500 residents. He now wants title deeds to be cancelled and uh, save thousands of Ugandans from being evicted. More details in this report. On 14th uh, October 2022, I received a letter from the re resident district commissioner Kikube uh, informing me about a complaint purportedly lodged by some residents of Musajamukuru, A, B, and Kibingo villages that I and two other people had acquired land titles over their lands uh, covering the three villages and we were threatened to evict them. Known as Plot 172, Block 22 at Musajamukuru East, bearing names of Muhumuza Job, Asera Stephen, and Nyabongo Charles Ochak. Uh, another title deed covering 297.6640 hectares, known as Plot 196, Block 22 at Mukabara all bearing the names of Nyabongo Charles, Ochaki, Ayebazibwe Patson, and Asera Stephen, was widely shared on social media platforms. The national identification number for Asera Stephen on all those uh, title deeds was mine. Considering uh, that the national identification number is a unique number that cannot be shared, I took this matter as a fraud and reported uh, to all the relevant officers, including the Office of the Speaker, Inspector General of Police, State House Anti-Corruption, Director CID, uh, Minister for Vunyora Affairs, and uh, Presidential Affairs Committee, uh, Minister of Lands, Housing, and Urban Development. I requested the Commission of Lands in charge of registration to cancel the title deeds of the said land since my name and NIN had been used without my authorization, and thus I suspected fraud in the processes leading to the registration. The cancellation of the title deed would provide a temporary remedy to the thousands of people who are at risk of eviction on the said land. Uh, a, a hearing date has been set on 30th November 2022, where the parties involved will be heard before the responsible authority can effect the cancellation of the title deeds that The State Minister for ICT, Joyce Nabosa Sebugwao, this week directed district leaders in Eastern Region to evict all encroachers on Posta Uganda properties as the corporation revamps. The Posta Uganda revamp comes at a time when all its 41 branches across the country are in a sorry state. Posta Uganda land and other properties have over time been encroached upon by unscrupulous people with most of its buildings dilapidated. They are not yet ready for the level of ICT because they are old. Some are dilapidated. So the primary objective is how to transform them, obviously to renovate them. The buildings need rehabilitation. They are very old and uh, some of the other uh, the, 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 some of the, 
the, the, the equipments are not working properly. The Minister of Information, Communication, Technology and National Guidance is carrying out a poster Uganda infrastructure audit to establish the state of the cooperation. We bring the surveyors to survey the place and, op and do the opening uh, of, of their land, which is going to be done uh, in two weeks' time. So one of the objectives is to see how do these pieces of infrastructure be customized or transformed to deliver ICT services. By ICT services, I mean government automating its delivery of services. Government has committed to partner with the private sector to provide a new face of Poster Uganda to match the dynamism of technology in the service delivery. We agreed with them, we have, we have signed an agreement with them to deliver uh, parcels, documents from, uh, from headquarters to, to districts. And then from districts, they will be delivering these parcels to the, back to the agents. The State Minister for ICT, Joyce Nabosa Sevguao, has now instructed district leaders to evict encroachers on poster Uganda land. Do you have plans? Don't you have plans? You, can, you have plans where you can uh, tell those people to go and do their, their businesses there. But what we want as the post office is to make sure that our, our, our land is free for our projects. Make sure that your people vacate our place, our, our place so that we can carry out our work. District administrators raised the challenge of untitled government land, which makes it difficult to protect it from grabbers. In terms of titling the land, uh, it would have been better if government would say all government land is titled without uh, incurring a lot of costs. But you find we have big chunks of land and a number of them but many don't have titles, so people are easy to come, find it easy to come and encroach on it. Part of the land had already been encroached on and even titled by the encroachers. The new face of Poster Uganda is expected to be competitive to match with the private companies already existing using technology for instant delivery of parcels and other packages. Abdul Nasser Luwama, UBC News. Construction of Ranyamahembe Seed School in Ranyamahembe Town, Kanso Kashari, South Mbarara District. This week was excited as Mbarara District leaders uh, visited the premises. The facility is expected to cost over 3 billion shillings and is to be completed in 24 months. The construction works was constructed, were contracted by Cream General and Technical Services, managed by Director Turumu John Paul, funded by government under UGIFT program. The district engineer, Bananuka William said, as these details are going to share with us. Mbara district leaders have commended government for giving them a seed school aimed at promoting education in the area. This was at a ceremony where construction of Ranya Mahembe Seed Secondary School was launched and witnessed by local council leaders RDC Mbarara Rogers Mbabazi, who presided over the function. It is situated in Kacherere Ward, Ranya Mahembe Town Council. Addressing the audience at the function, RDC Mbarara Rogers Mbawazi requested the local leaders and the population in the school community to cooperate with the contractor to produce quality work. The chairperson of Mbarara District, Tabaro Didas, thanked the government for supporting the district in constructing the seed secondary school that will cost over 3 billion shillings that will settle the challenges of learners traveling long distances. To construct this seed secondary school and as you can see the distance from this second seed secondary school to Tom is, is very long so uh, we appreciate now we can now comfortably say that the learners from this area are going to access free education as a, under U, 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 USE. The contractor and administrator, Cream General and Technical Services, Turiamoreba, Claudio, 
assured government and school community that they will produce excellent quality work and the work will be executed according to the bills of quantity and specifications. For best, we have tested experience, we have uh, uh, enough material, enough equipment, human resource, so we are very ready and prepared to start off. And so in that uh, spirit, we shall make sure that we employ people who have the expertise and the zeal, of course, to work with us. Those who want to work with us, uh, casual workers, uh, even professionals, if they are available, uh, we shall try to incorporate them in our team. And so let's now take a short commercial break. When we return, we'll be back with more news. Stay tuned. So, I'm here to announce that the MTN Kampala Marathon is back. And this year, we are running for babies. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh, to be clear, I am not talking about a baby. <laughs> No, and neither am I talking about to be baby. <laughs> I am talking about these small dollars. <laughs> Running for babies in the MTN Kampala Marathon on Sunday, 20th November 2022. Dial star 165 star 77 hash or use the Momo app to register. Welcome to the Living Room Stadium. It's the FIFA World Cup. The match is about to start. Food and drink ready. There's no space left for anyone. Come on, get your lucky chair. Take your usual spot. Even the puppy has one. It's preparation time. You can feel the tension in the air. And you, do you have everything you need to believe? That's right. The Voice is coming to a city near you. From the 21st of October to the 10th of November, you get a chance to showcase your talent. Prepare a one-minute MP4 video of yourself singing and upload it to thevoice.africa to register. Make sure you have a valid Airtel number and if you're shortlisted, you will be contacted to come in for the live auditions. Well, don't just stand there, let's go! Music your passion. Africa your stage. The Voice Africa. Connected by Airtel. The Ministry of Health informs the public that there are confirmed cases of Ebola in Uganda. We, however, urge the public not to panic as the situation is being managed. The Ministry of Health further reminds the public to be on the lookout for any persons who may show signs and symptoms of Ebola. These include high body temperature, abdominal pains, diarrhea, vomiting, bleeding from the body openings such as the nose, eyes, and mouth. Please inform the the nearest health worker immediately if you see anyone with these signs and symptoms to prevent Ebola from spreading further please take the following preventive measures regular washing of hands with water and soap avoid handshaking and hugging avoiding any contact with any suspected Ebola patients any person who dies suddenly should not be buried but reported to the nearest health worker or LC1 immediately for further information please call the Ministry of Health toll-free number on 0800 -1 000066 or send a free SMS to your report on 8500. This message is from the Ministry of Health with support from UNICEF and World Health Organization. Everybody's ready. 
Wait a second, not everybody. Come on, dude, it's the FIFA World Cup. You're going to lose your seat, the ritual seat, the lucky one. Losing more than a seat, your team is going to lose. Where are you, dude? The match is about to start. Your friends won't hold out much longer. Excuse me, excuse me. Finally, everything is in the right place. Hey, other hand. And you, do you have everything you need to believe? Uh, so, I'm here to announce that the MTN Kampala Marathon is back. And this year, we are running for babies. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh, to be clear, I am not talking about a baby. <laughs> No, <laughs> and neither am I talking about to be baby. <laughs> I am talking about these small dollars. <laughs> Run for babies in the MTN Kampala Marathon on Sunday, 20th November 2022. Dial star 165 star 77 hash or use the Momo app to register. Welcome back. You're still watching the UBC Lunchtime News broadcasting live from Nyla Avenue. Now, what do you know about diabetes? Personally, I can say that diabetes is a metabolic disorder in which the body has high sugar levels for prolonged periods of time. Now, once again in studio, I'm glad to host Professor Lawrence Magisha, the president of the Lions Club of Kampala Central. Welcome, Mr. Lawrence Magisha. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here once again. So from the last time I hosted you, we were talking about uh, blindness. But now this time, the Lions Club is bringing to us awareness about diabetes, information about diabetes for a safer tomorrow. So enlighten us about this initiative. What is it and uh, what is spearheading uh, this drive? Yes, thank you so much. Once again, our dear viewers, we are glad to be here once again. I'm talking mostly about these non-communicable diseases. Diabetes is one of the non-communicable diseases that is on a rise globally, affecting a lot of uh, many people. For example, right now, about 415 million people uh, have diabetes globally, and one in two uh, adults don't know their status. Uh, whether they are diabetic or not, but most of them are diabetic and they are not aware. Every six seconds, a person dies from diabetes. And for Uganda, about uh, more than 500 people uh, have diabetes, but the most important in Uganda, more than 50% don't know their status. Is, and that is, is, is a very, very, very big concern. Is diabetes also a genetic disease, once one way or another? Yes, diabetic, depending on the type of genetics, yes, the genetic background of your family can predispose you, can be a risk to you for having diabetes. Because mm. we, have to, we have about four different types of diabetes. Mm. We have what we call type 1 diabetes, we have type 2 diabetes, we have pre-diabetic uh, condition, and we have what we call gestational uh, uh, diabetes, which mm. affects uh, pregnant women. So especially when we talk about uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, th that is when the, your pancreas fails to manufacture enough insulin, which is responsible for breaking down the sugars in your body. Mm. But when we talk about uh, type 2 diabetes, it is related to what we take into our bodies and uh, leads to high blood sugars in our bodies mm. and then predisposes us to diabetes. Okay. Yes. So why is the Lions Club of Kampala Central this time uh, prioritizing diabetes? Uh, Lions Club is a uh, part of Lions Club International and we have five global causes and one of the global causes is diabetes in order to prevent diabetes uh, globally. But quite specifically now, it's because 14, every 14th of November is a world diabetes day. Mm. And uh, this year, the theme is education for tomorrow. 
in order to prevent diabetes. And actually, I've also just checked for Uganda, the same is about sharing knowledge in order to improve diabetes care. So to that's why we are here. To be specific, education for tomorrow or diabetes education for tomorrow? Diabetes education for tomorrow because mm. people need to know their status now so that they live a happy life tomorrow. Mm. Because diabetes is a, 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 a long-term condition that mm. you can suffer with uh, for most of years until you depart from this world. So the better you know, Ari, the better you can prevent diabetes, live well with diabetes. But most importantly, for those who are not uh, yet diabetic, to be able to prevent diabetes. So, Professor, educators, how can one be able to avoid diabetes? One diabetes, as I said, is a, a chronic uh, condition, a lifestyle condition. If it is not type 1 diabetes where your pancreas fails. But the other type of uh, diabetes is a lifestyle condition. It depends on how we regulate uh, what we take into our body. For, for example, in terms of diet, if we are taking to uh, carbohydrates which are not very good carbohydrates, Carbohydrates, uh, there are different types. We have the good carbohydrates and uh, the carbohydrates which are not good. For example? So, uh, for example, if you take fine bread, fine portion, uh, fine uh, rice, that is not good type of carbohydrates. Mm. But if you take uh, unrefined uh, rice, a uh, posho, a uh, whole blend, that is a good type of carbohydrates. And that's what we need. The body needs carbohydrates in order to make energy. But if we take bad carbohydrates, then the body converts them into bad sugars. We end up with high cholesterol in the body. It leads to what we call blood sugar glucose in our bodies. And that is very dangerous mm. because uh, diabetes is actually a group of diseases. Mm. It, uh, because it will affect, once you get high blood sugar in your bodies, it will affect several organs. It will start with blood vessels. And once blood vessels are disorganized, the rest of the body systems, kidneys, uh, heart, organs, all of them become affected. And that's why you end up with uh, uh, a heart attack. That's why you end up with stroke. It's because diabetes has wrecked what, the entire body system. Professor Mujisha, some of our audience might not perfectly understand what the difference between refined rice and unrefined rice is, or refined posho or unrefined. Just help us demystify this Yeah, I just concept. want to help us that when we grow grain, uh, maize, uh, rice, when we harvest the seed, we have a tendency of removing the outer coat. Once you remove the outer coat, you are start, we are now going towards an, uh, a very refined type of carbohydrate. You are removing the fiber content of the carbohydrates which is needed our, in our body. So especially when we go to posho, we have grade one, grade two, grade three, you have heard about those ones. That's a very, very refined posho, which is not very good. We are supposed to take the whole grain whole grain without removing the outer coat, which is a husk. So uh, I call upon the public really that uh, our bodies need carbohydrates, but we need to take good type of carbohydrates, but also in moderation. But doctor, I'll also take you back to, to also perhaps rice. How, how is it refined or unrefined? Uh, 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 rice also has an outer coat, a husk. Mm. And when it is prepared, it, uh, you, 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 remove the, you don't remove the husk. It is prepared. The rice is ground together with the husk. And there we, you have a, a, a rice, which is whole rice. The husk is the hard outer, the outer part. Uh, the outer part. So are you saying we cook the rice with a hard outer part? There is a way the, the, the companies process it so mm. that it doesn't become, uh, that outer husk is not, uh, becomes edible. Uh, part of the rice, so uh, we buy what we call whole grain rice. Mm. And in some companies, they have gone further to say brown rice. But uh, why is it brown rice? It's because that outer coat which brings the, uh, the, the brownness in the mm. rice. Yes. So, Professor, I'll, I'll go ahead to ask you. Uh, mm. So, why then does government then let the companies then uh, refine their rice and yet they know that this could be a health danger, uh, a hazard? It, it is all about consumer preferences. Mm. Yes, so, uh, once, and that's why we are bringing about education. Because we feel and we think that if I take uh, maize, a uh, whole grain maize, which uh, we have not removed the outer coat, that is a very type of, a bad type of what? Of posho. It looks brown, it looks rough. 
we, we, for us we want a, a white one which is very white and smooth and that is about consumer preferences not knowing the implications mm. so that's why we are bringing about uh, this education about uh, awareness because that is one of the major components that can reduce uh, the risks to diabetes followed by lifestyle mm. a lifestyle i'm talking about exercises Mm. Uh, to do some regular physical exercises and when I say exercises doesn't mean that you go to the gym mm. just even simple walks for 30 minutes mm. uh, when you step out of the car taking a walk not all the time go in the car go to the office you are seated that is what we call sedentary lifestyle it predisposes you to diabetes because in the process you become very fat mm. you become obese and obese is one of the biggest risk factors for diabetes. What about sugar and soda consumption? Now, uh, when uh, our bodies, as I said, they need sugar. But uh, the, the body system, it sort of has the mechanism of regulating sugars. But if you of, uh, expose them to too much sugar, then the body does not have enough time uh, to, to be able to process that sugar. So you end up with uh, unprocessed uh, sugars that uh, remain in, uh, in your blood system, and that is not good. That's why we are supposed to regulate what, how much we take. It's, it doesn't mean that we stop taking, no. Regulate how much sugars you take into your body. If my biology is still good, then uh, I would as assume that if you still have those excess sugars, perhaps those excess sugars can be taken away with exercise? Is yeah, it? with exercises, mm. uh, regular exercises, having active, but your body is being active all the time, then you are helping your body to take mm. out those sugars. Okay. Yes. So enlighten us about how... Uh, what is the rate of carbohydrate uh, of diabetes? What is uh, the prevalence rate in Uganda, and what are the statistics? The biggest problem we have in Uganda is lack of data, because most people, as I've said, mm. they don't know their status. They even don't go for a regular screening. So the information we have is underestimated, because mm. I've said uh, about five hundred thousand people have diabetes. But that is an underestimate. And the majority of the people don't know. And I've said uh, one of the risk factors for diabetes is age. And in most countries, it is 45 years and above. But in Uganda, the mean age is 35 years. So we have got people within the middle age that have diabetes, but they don't know. Mm. And uh, that's why we are calling upon the public, uh, especially during this part of the World Diabetes Day, that lets all of us take interest in knowing what we need to, do, to know about diabetes and what we can do. And the most important thing is to go for the regular health checks. The good news, checks for diabetes are very cheap. Mm. Yeah, this is uh, a, sim a simple prick on your finger with a glucometer, you are able to tell your, boy, your, your sugar levels mm. and then you monitor. Together with the exercises, you keep monitoring and whenever you are in a very good uh, rate, then you are, you are good to go. Another risk factor is high blood pressure. So when mm. you are checking for diabetes, also check your high by your blood pressure. Mm. Those two things are very, very critical to, mm. uh, to, to monitoring diabetes. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lawrence Mujisha, for enlightening us about diabetes. Diabetes are metabolic disorder which the body has high sugar levels for long periods of time. Please do care to get yourself tested. Get a sugar test. It doesn't really cost much between 6,000 to 10,000 shillings and you should be able to know your life condition. Otherwise, let's take a short commercial break and be back with more Lunchtime News. So, I'm here to announce that the MTN Kampala Marathon is back. And this year, we are running for babies. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Uh, to be clear, I am not talking about a baby. <laughs> No, <laughs> and neither am I talking about to be baby. <laughs> I am talking about these small dollars. Oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> Run for babies in the MTN Kampala Marathon on Sunday, 20th November 2022. Dial star 165 star 77 hash or use the Momo app to register. Welcome. Welcome back and back to the weekly roundup edition of the Lunchtime News. Now, an Italian agricultural machinery manufacturer federation specialized in production of heavy agricultural equipment has hinted at plans of establishing an outlet in Uganda. The president of the Feda Unacoma, Alessandro Malovoti, says that the investment is to ease farm accessibility to genuine agricultural machinery. This was at the opening of the 45th AMA International Exhibition in Bolog Bologna, Italy, with exhibitors of agricultural machinery from across the globe. Let's take a look. Bologna, Italy is the host of this year's AIMA International Agricultural Machinery Exhibition with over 300,000 delegates in attendance. Quality and unique, yet of latest technology, is the best way to describe the machinery showcased here. Celebrated Ghanaian actor, John Dumelo is one of the many farmers from far and wide partaking of the exhibition. I mean, I've seen so many machinery. I've seen different tractors. I've seen combined harvesters like the one behind me. I've seen, you know, uh, irrigation uh, systems that that are superb. And I think these are the kind of of technology that we need back home in Africa. Farmers from developing economies, especially Africa are accused of failing to appreciate quality equipment. That they buy a lot of very cheap machine, but after two or three years they throw this machine away. And this is a waste of money. Probably they save 30-35% in the um, beginner, beginning cost of purchasing, but they waste all the capital. Uh, the Italian machine, the European machine, the American machine can last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I think for the African farmer we look at efficiency. And so there are some, there are some machines that are expensive, there are some machines that are moderately priced, and there are some machines that are cheap. But if it can do the job, it will do the job. Investing in quality machinery has never been a luxury but a necessity for any serious farmer. And with the growing demand for mechanized agriculture, farmers have been advised to never settle for anything less but quality and durable equipment that guarantees great returns on investment. It is here that Alessandro Malavoti, the president of Fadauna Koma, hinted on the Federation's plan to set up an outlet in Uganda to ease on accessibility for genuine agricultural machinery. This is a project that we have done in some other countries and it was quite successful. Uh, we think the possibility also to make it in Uganda is just an agreement between the Cultural Minister of Uganda and the Foreign Minister of Italy. So we try to arrange this kind of business uh, of, uh, they say, the modern farm. Think like that. I hope in a couple of years, two or three years, to succeed in this project. Statements of Agriculture Fred Wino Chakulaga welcomed this move, noting that government was already advancing a proposal for an assembling plant. As government, we want to work with the, the people that have hosted us, the Italian uh, Federation for the Agriculture Equipment Manufacturers, so that uh, we link them up with the private sector in Uganda and then the government supports that linkage. They can be, it can be a franchise, it can be a partnership, it can be any kind of relationship. Then with us in the government, we support it. Minister Wino adds that Uganda has what it takes to facilitate such partnerships, especially in the production supply chain. For example, batteries. Batteries can be manufactured in Uganda. We have uh, raw materials. And to some extent, we have uh, the private sector that's already involved in this. The Mulwanas are there. So that's uh, another stage where we think that uh, we can incrementally have 
local content in this equipment. Docas Kimono, UBC TV News, in Bologna, Italy. Yes, I really do believe that most of the land in Uganda is being underutilized, especially because we haven't yet adopted uh, agricultural mechanization to its full scale. I believe places like Karamoja wouldn't be suffering much from the drought and famine they are if agricultural mechanization is instilled in those places. Otherwise, thank you for being a lovely audience. My name is Abdullah Mark Arnold, and stay on UBC TV for more news in our subsequent bulletins. Have yourselves a great afternoon.